that was fighting for gay rights mm -hmm. and people were killed. Nobody they were killed at Stonewall. Nobody was Nobody. killed. When it comes to the drag world of Thailand, Pangina Heels has had a huge influence within the community, an achievement that ended up leading her to international success. Subsequently, the first time that she really got the spotlight on her was with the announcement that she would be co-hosting Drag Race Thailand. Despite this, most viewers today wouldn't fully understand who Pangina truly was until she competed on UK vs. The World. But despite having the world shook with one of the most heart-wrenching eliminations from recent years, there's a lot more to Pangina than meets the eye. In this video, I'm going to dive into the life and career of Pangina Heels and her inevitable rise to the queen that she is today. But before we start, please make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and follow me on Twitter at GreenGayYT. Also, I'm looking for new adaptations of my Green Gay logo, so if interested, just DM me your version on Twitter. And special thanks to Pangina Heels for agreeing to be interviewed by me during the making of this video. Let's begin. When you look at Pangina both in and out of drag, all you really see is perfection, with every one of her posts on social media being various aesthetically pleasing. But it hasn't always been easy. Pangina says that growing up, she suffered from many mental health challenges, which reflected in having issues with eating disorders and being bullied for being overweight. This had a lasting effect on her, and it wasn't until she started getting into the art form of drag along with her pre-existing love for dancing that she felt she could start the healing process and inevitably accept who she really was. When you really think about it, the rise in popularity of Pangina heels was very impressive considering she was only on four episodes of RuPaul's Drag Race before being eliminated. Although it's within that time that she earned a lot of respect from viewers. Plus, when it came to her being the first judge to compete on a season, everyone was curious to see how she'd do. I also wonder which producer came up with the idea because I had never seen any fans suggesting a host participate on All Stars. But I'm glad it happened. Part of what made Pangina intriguing is that there wasn't a lot of background that we got to know from the two judges of the Thailand franchise, aside from them already being pretty successful within their country. It was a stark contrast to RuPaul, who by the time he began with season 1, he already had a background within American pop culture, as the most well-known drag queen in America. So then, what's there to know about Pangina? In Pangina's early adulthood, she actually spent a lot of years living in Los Angeles. This would expose her to what drag culture was like in Western countries, allowing her to expand on her already existing knowledge of what Thailand's drag culture was like. As we know, Pangina's first true exposure to drag was because she was a huge Lady Gaga fan and entered a competition for who was the best Lady Gaga impersonator, something that she'd end up winning, earning the prize of an all-expenses-paid trip to watch Lady Gaga perform live. In a way, this was sort of a good omen for Pangina, and her interest on the possibilities of what drag could bring to her began to pique her interest. And so, with drag being a sort of love at first sight, along with the many years that she had spent strengthening her skills as a dancer, would end up mending together into the performance style that we'd see as her career progressed. And thus, one of the first times that the spotlight was truly on Pangina was in 2014, when she competed in a competition called Tea Battle. Tea Battle was the first drag queen competition show from Thailand. The queens would showcase different performances for every episode, and were even living together in a house, sort of like Big Brother. This was a very exciting moment for Pangina, since she'd be able to have a platform to show the drag world within Thailand just how much the art form meant to her. Yet, it felt like the universe had different things in mind. A day before the competition started, Pangina ended up breaking her leg. Production then had to rush her to the hospital, and after receiving medical attention, some of the producers told Pangina that they couldn't have her continuing the competition because they didn't want to be held liable for allowing an injured contestant to continue on in a performance-based TV show. But despite on Drag Race where many injured contestants end up succumbing to their injuries and leaving the show, Pangina didn't give up there. She went as far as to creating a whole scene at the hospital so that the production would have no choice but to let her continue on competing despite the circumstances that she was now in. Um, well, we were at the hospital. Um, all of the production was like, we can't be liable for you. We, you can't be in this competition. You have to go home. And I literally had a strategy where I cried so loud in the hospital and made a huge scene. I was like, this is fucking unfair. And just because I broke my leg, you did not mean my spirit is broken. And so I literally, I literally just was like, no, no, not going home. You can't make me. Wheel me out of this place. Candy Zionide, who was also competing, protested to the production, saying that if Pangina quit, then she would also be going home too, because many of the queens had already built a close bond together. Eventually, production gave in to Pangina's wishes and allowed her to continue on in the competition. Only this time, she'd be in a wheelchair for almost the whole season. Although it's really cool to see the way that she'd build her performances in the competition around her injury, such as this one where she danced alongside Candy Zionide 
Cyanide, who would go on to compete on Drag Race Thailand Season 2. Her performance in the wheelchair is really fun to look at because she incorporates her injury into the story of the character she's playing. By the end of the 12-week competition, Pangina ended up healing her leg on the last two episodes, and would subsequently win the entire show. Pretty soon, she was already back to performing the way that she usually does. Which, by the way, when Pangina said that she was known back home for her whacking, she wasn't kidding. Throughout almost a decade before getting on UK vs. The World, Pangina was strongly influenced by the art form. If you didn't know, whacking is a dance style that originates from the 1970s by gay, black, and Hispanic men. It involves, as you can see, taking up a lot of space with your body, specifically the stretching of your arms and fast movements that are tied to the beat of the music. It was a way for many gay men to freely express themselves by letting loose to the music within the safe space that the queer community had built. Unfortunately, most of the pioneers within the art form of whacking did not live to see today, many of them falling victim to the AIDS pandemic. And so, throughout the late 80s and until the early 2000s, the art form of whacking sort of disappeared, until some of the former dancers began to try to re-establish the art form within the scene, eventually paving the way for modern figures of the whacking world, such as Princess Lockeroo, who Pangina has cited as a big inspiration. Needless to say, by 2015, Pangina had already achieved for herself a pretty big name within the queer community of Thailand. Yet, what is Thailand's drag culture? Thailand's drag draws a lot of inspiration from the country's history. Some Something that's sort of unique about Thailand is that they've never been colonized, so a lot of their rich history has been preserved for centuries, and you can see how it's incorporated into the drag style of many entertainers. On the other hand, in western countries, most performances we see at clubs tend to draw inspiration from mainstream singers such as Lady Gaga, Britney Spears, or Beyonce. Another big contrast is that while in the United States there's the pageant system of drag, with pageants such as Miss Continental, in Thailand the most acclaimed pageant is the Miss Tiffany pageant, which is an annual event that celebrates transgender women. And it's actually a pretty high budget event that's been going on for over two decades. But while Thailand does celebrate transgender individuals and many queer art forms, they have a severe lack of understanding of the details behind these communities. What I mean by this is that there's a lack of knowledge over what the meaning of a drag queen even is. So while it's widely accepted, it tends to be due to the fact that most of the general public doesn't differentiate between the different types of social groups. So they end up being lumped together, such as viewing trans gender women and drag queens as the same thing. Which brings us as to why the introduction of Drag Race Thailand was so important. Drag Race Thailand should get a lot more props than it does because it was truly ahead of the curve. I mean, it was the first spin-off from the show, but also the first one to not have RuPaul as the main host. Even the way they conducted the marketing for this season was impressive. You could tell that they had a lot of artistic direction. It also clearly showcased the different perspectives that the queens had from Thailand over what we'd seen on RuPaul's version, due to how creatively many of the runway themes were approach. On February 15, 2018, the first season of Drag Race Thailand was released, featuring the first ever international cast of queens. One of the first things that you could notice was that there was a lot of passion that emitted from Pangina and Art Arya, with the way that they were able to interact with the queens and give them advice that would truly help them succeed in the competition. The first season of the show was also just trying to find its footing, so it wasn't so much about exaggerating the judging to make for good TV, but really they just focused on trying to harness the talent of the contestants. Also, despite knowing a good portion of the queens that competed, both of the judges were very honest with their critiques. Like if you want to know just how professional Pangina is, Bandit, who was a contestant on Drag Race Thailand Season 2, actually designed a good portion of Pangina's looks for Season 1 and 2. But despite this, Pangina did not show any favoritism towards Bandit, and gave her negative critiques when needed. While Pangina never actually competed on Drag Race Thailand, we would get to see her perspective of drag through the many big and extravagant outfits that would sometimes bruise up her body from how heavy they were. Another thing that's unique to Thailand's franchise is that they held open auditions where it wasn't a requirement for you to be a Thai citizen in order to compete, with three of the queens on season 2 not being of Thai descent, and many of them actually only spoke English, which is why behind the scenes the production of the show would translate for the English speaking queens what the description of the challenge was on a given week. It also brought up some funny moments with some of the Thailand queens talking crap in their own language about the English speakers even though they could fully hear them. This this leads to the question of whether we could potentially see queens from other international franchises participate on international all-star seasons. Yet some feel that it would be hard to translate the humor of non-English speakers through to the judges. But I mean, Michelle Visage did say that she would have learned Spanish to host Drag Race Spain. So really, anything's possible. As we know, Drag Race Thailand had two co-hosts, Pinjaya Heels and Art Aria. At first, Art Aria was contacted to be just a consultant for the show as they began the planning stages of how it 
episode would look like. It's here where she'd give her input on decisions such as having Pangina as a co-host, and would inevitably get offered by producers to host the show too. In fact, Art is actually heavily involved in the production of the show, and makes decisions such as the runway themes for each episode, challenges, and even the cast itself. Pangina is just there to eat her lunch and judge some queens. What made the pairing of these two queens so good was that Pangina's strengths mostly relied on her performance ability, while Art had a very extensive knowledge on fashion and had worked with many important figures within the fashion community in Thailand. So it was a perfect mix of a diverse range of judging styles. By Thailand Season 2, the format of the show was slightly altered, with Art Arya being more of the main host of the series. But Pangina still had a presence within the judging panel. As for why this change happened, who knows. But it does remind me of Canada's Drag Race where they heavily tried to emphasize on Season 1 that Brooklyn Heights was not the main host of the show, and that it was actually equally distributed among the judges. But as soon as Season 2 started, it was clear that they focused a lot more on making Brooke have more of a dominating presence in the series moving forward. Drag Race Thailand, unlike in the US seasons, wasn't all that strict when it came to allowing the queens to hang out together in the hotel rooms when they weren't being filmed. They were even going shopping together and often would go on outings to buy clothes that they would later on wear in the runway. Uh, because like this mall is like, we have this mall in Thailand which is like the Diagon Alley of drag queens. So there's like literally the entire building. So I would go there and I would see all of them together huddled in a fucking group like little ducklings and just hey do you think this is good for me i'm like y'all are crazy wait so they were buying clothes that they would later wear in the workroom together no for the runway another highlight from the series was how on one of the episodes of drag race thailand art aria was not able to film the episode so it was decided that pangina heels would host her own episode and be able to make the decision for that week's elimination it is in this episode where instead of saying the franchise's catchphrase may the best woman win pangina said may the best human win. Speaking of judging, one of the more controversial moments of the Thailand franchise was when Miss Mocha Diva was eliminated from the competition. And right before she sashayed away, she told the judges that Miss Jim Huai, a fellow contestant, had broken the rules of the competition because the week prior she had utilized the bike for her runway look, which wasn't originally in the workroom and was against the rules. This sort of rubbed the judges the wrong way since it seems sort of random to bring it up now. But nevertheless, after Mocha Diva was eliminated, Miss Jim Huai was then disqualified. Meanwhile, Vivaldi broke the rules by sneaking in her own phone, but was still allowed to continue the competition. Yet the shocks didn't end there. What we also got was some really amazing runways, including Candy Zionite, who set herself on fire as a reveal, resulting in her spending the rest of the day applying burn cream to her face. But she did end up winning the challenge, so it sort of worked out for her at least. This is the Hunger Games, darling. It surely is. The only negatives that fans had about the franchise was the way they formatted some of the episodes. The mini challenges didn't feel like mini challenges because they would end up lasting almost 20 minutes and sometimes for almost half the episode, and then they would be heavily judged on it while on the main stage, almost as if most of the mini challenges should have just been considered main challenges. A lot of fans also didn't really want to get into the season, due to the fact that they had to read subtitles, something that to non-anime watchers can be a tedious task. But my advice would be to do what Jinx Mon Soon did, who said that she watched every episode of Drag Race Thailand without ever reading the subtitles, or understanding what any of the queens were saying, and had to rely entirely on context clues to figure out what was going on. It was clear that Drag Race Thailand wasn't shy of veering away from the main format of the show. Art Arya said that when it came to eliminating queens on their season, they decided to not go with the catchphrase of sashay away. Instead, they gave each queen a personalized message to show them how much they loved and appreciated them. And it's awesome that they took so many creative liberties, especially with how they eliminated each queen. After all, it could have been worse. I mean, in 2017, it was found out that there was a Portuguese translation of the show that translated Sashay Away to Bye, Go Home, no one loves you. Anyway, if there's anything from Drag Race Thailand that deserves the praise it gets, is the way that they produce their finale episodes. Because it's a whole spectacle, featuring an entire live audience, and a stage that looks super expensive. And the way that the queens were presented really felt elevated compared to Rue's version, where it feels like they haven't elevated the staging of their finale shows in a good while. As mentioned before, Thailand can be fairly open-minded in terms of drag queens, yet there's still a good portion of their population that don't fully understand 
understand it. Thailand's franchise, just like Drag Race installments all around the world, help people in their homes expose themselves to a group of people that they would have otherwise never even thought about, which can bring more empathy towards social issues. So it's a shame that after season 2, we wouldn't really hear anything about renewing the show for over 4 years. When we talk about opening doors, Drag Race Thailand created a platform for Pangina to further her career with. In 2018, she flew to Los Angeles to attend her first ever DragCon and meet her longtime idol, Wu Pa. And Wu had no idea that she was standing next to the future boost in her ratings. What's awesome about Pangina is that she has a pretty cool relationship with her parents, who've always been very supportive of her. And their parenting skills helped mold Pangina to become the businesswoman she is today. Her family also supported the fact that Pangina decided to become a drag queen. In 2019, they did a special photo shoot where Pangina did a makeover on both her father and auntie, which was a pretty big deal. The goal of this was that he wanted to show the world that love has nothing to do with gender, and that acceptance does not have any barriers. And you know what, all the story really tells me is that I'm curious to see how Pangina will do when she competes on the All Stars 12 Makeover Challenge. By 2020, it had been more than a year since the last season of Drag Race Thailand aired, and there was no news about season 3 coming up. While this was happening, Pangina decided to do something for the Bangkok drag community which would lead to her opening up her first club. The House of Heels is a bar owned by Pangina located in Bangkok, which opened in the late summer of 2020. Pangina felt that in Thailand, the venues that were booking drag queens didn't really do so out of an admiration for drag, so there wasn't enough appreciation put into it. And so when she made the House of Heels, she made sure that the whole environment of the venue was catered around making the drag queens look and feel like the stars they were. Although despite offering an environment that was open-minded and friendly, it wouldn't take long before there was drama surrounding it. By late 2020, Pangina ended up getting into some drama with one of her previous designers that she had worked with. It all started when one night at House of Heels, the designer had decided to visit the venue. But when he said hi to Pangina, she apparently ignored him. This led to the designer getting really ticked off by it. So much so that he decided to spread a false rumor that Pangina was super transphobic, slandering her name wherever he went. But according to Pangina, she never ignored him at the club. And it was just a misunderstanding. I was in a pink hat woman's suit. I can't see anything. Um, and he thought that I thought I was better than everybody else and decided to just say spread lies, which caused people to think that I am transphobic. It was like a pot that was already hot. And that caused so many people to attack me. I didn't feel safe where I was going. People were going on Facebook lives and just saying these horrible things about me that they don't even know. And it's crazy because a lot of the people that I know that worked with me then turned on me, which is why um, it's good when these things happen because you really know who's going to be there for you. Bart was there for me. But during that time, like I've learned like the, sometimes the people that are around you don't really have good intentions for you. Regardless, Pinjana would end up taking things a step further by contacting a lawyer and creating a lawsuit against them until he was forced to apologize to Pinjana for what he had done. How embarrassing. Less than a year after opening up her first drag bar, things started to really take off for Pinjana. Which brings us to, of course, UK versus the world. You might think to yourself that since Pinjana had never actually competed on Drag Race due to her being a judge, that she wouldn't have gained much out of her experience in her own franchise. But her time on Drag Race Thailand would allow for Pangina to learn more about fashion and silhouettes, because every episode she was trying to serve a look that was worthy of being on television. A fun fact is that a couple years before competing on RuPaul's Drag Race, when asked about the possibility of competing on a US season, she said, quote, I'd aim for the stars and I'd at least land on the moon. And that's exactly what ended up happening. When the cast of UK vs The World was announced, Pangina arguably stuck out the most since she was the only queen that had never been a contestant on a franchise before. There had also never been a real girl of Thai descent before, so Pangina was the first queen from Southeast Asia to compete on the show. It's important to point out that while there has been contestants in the past of Southeast Asian descent, Pangina was still the first to actually fly in from Asia to the set. So there was a lot of added pressure since she had flown over 21 hours to be on the show. Show, and there was the possibility that she could go home early and disappoint the people back home that had waited so long for something like this to happen to someone within their community. English is my second language, number one. I'm not an American citizen. So when I fly here, it's that added pressure of like, oh bitch, if you go back on the first week and you just had a 21 hour flight, that is, oh my God, detrimental. And 
think so many people were like, oh, we wanted a Thai queen to be on. All of that was just weighing on my shoulders. Which is probably why prior to the filming of the premiere episode, Pinjina cried for hours in her hotel room the night before filming had begun because of how much pressure she felt representing Thailand. On UK vs. The World episode 1, Pinjina showcased her whacking skills in her talent show number, which landed her in the top two with Jimbo. It's here where she'd win the lip sync and choose to eliminate Lemon over Janie Jackay. While it was sad to see Lemon go, it made sense to eliminate her, since there was at least one other queen left to represent Canada. But of course, even that wouldn't last long. On episode 2, we got a peek into how elevated Pangina's runway package for the show was. When getting ready for UK vs the World, Art Aria played a big role in helping out Pangina with her runway package. It also helped that she was such a big name within the industry, so there was a lot of designers that had no problem working with Pangina thanks to Art's status. And it's clear that the hard work paid off. We, Art Aria had a meeting with us and we had like we went up with a list of all the best designers in Thailand and Art knew, knows all of them because she's in the industry. So literally it was like, we called them up. We had the best of the best, um, you know, designers, seamstresses. And it was just a huge thing. It's literally like going to the Olympics. By the time we get to episode three is when things begin to change in terms of the dynamic in the competition. While Pagina Heels landed in the top two along with Janie Jack Hay, she would end up choosing to eliminate Jimbo who had just won two challenges and was a clear favorite of RuPaul's. Another added factor was that Jujubee had spent every episode sort of giving us really underwhelming challenge performances and runway presentations. After Jimbo's elimination aired, Pangina dealt with fans sending her floods of hate. And the following week when her own elimination aired, those same fans were telling her that her being eliminated was the product of karma. When we get to the finale episode of UK vs the World, Pangina recounts that she really didn't view the circumstances of her elimination and Jimbo's elimination as the same thing. Something that puzzled many viewers since they were both frontrunners that were cut short as soon as they landed at the bottom. According to Pangina, she didn't look at track record when making her decisions to eliminate the queens. Because it's not something that she's ever acknowledged even when she was a judge on Thailand. To her, your place in the competition was determined by how you did on a given week. And she genuinely felt that Jimbo had truly performed the worst on that episode. While it was sad to see Jimbo go, it was such good TV for Pangina to end up making the decisions that she did. All that being said, while to many viewers it seemed very clear that Pangina was now being viewed as a target by all of the other queens, it seemed that it wasn't the same from Pangina's point of view. According to Pangina, shortly after Jimbo's elimination, it didn't seem like any of the other queens were that bothered by her decision. None of the queens had said that she was a threat, so it didn't seem like anyone was gunning to get her out. Even when Blue and Baga were lip syncing, Pangina was rooting for Blue to win because she had no idea what was awaiting her. Not at all. I was just like in my own world. I was like, oh my god, I'm doing well. It's been three weeks. I thought I was going to go home first. Everything's chill and lovey dovey. And I'm like really close to Blue on the show too. So I was like, she got my back. That's why during the lip sync, I was cheering for her, not knowing that I was going to get kicked out. I was like, go, Blue, you better do it. You better work it. Um, and so that's even worse that um, I was cheering for the bitch that sent me home, which is hilarious. Another layer as to why Pangina's elimination was so shocking was the sheer amount of emotion that she let out as it was happening. A tearful goodbye that had everyone sort of shook. Her breakdown stemmed from how much it meant to her to be the first Thai queen to compete on the first international season of Drag Race. Finally put the drag of their country on a pedestal. After all, Pangina helped pioneer some of the aspects of Thailand's drag community. So in a way, getting on RuPaul's Drag Race felt like the big opportunity that she had been waiting for her entire life. Art Arya actually reacted to Pangina's elimination and it really showed just how gentle of a person Art is. Congratulations Pangina on winning episode 3 on UK Drag Race versus the world, but pan pan, your makeup as Pikachu is horrible. You ugly, horrible, yellow hair, and you know what? You can't go up to the north anymore. <laughs> you doomed forever. You can't go to Canada. You fuck, 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 and fuck. <laughs> but she also gave Pangina the love she deserved. So no more winner logo or anything on your outfit, okay? Because if you still feel you are the winner, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> you're perfect you're beautiful makeup darling although one of the good things that came from her elimination is that by the time filming was done she didn't require any makeup wipes because her tears had done the job for her ultimately while the disappointment that Benjina felt was very heavy it didn't take long for her to mentally recover from her elimination after all she had won two challenges before being eliminated and displayed a pretty good package in terms of drag as to her opinion on blue hydrangea Pangina doesn't really care whether or not it was a strategic move but admits that blue's decision 
even made sense since Vangina already had two repeater badges. If she went back on the show, what she would change would be to create alliances with other queens, as she realizes that that can be a big benefit when getting to the end of the season. There was a good portion of fans that thought that the exposure the Pangina heals got from UK vs the world would hopefully drive more people to go watch Drag Race Thailand. And after she became a fan favorite, I was also hopeful that we'd get a third season of Thailand's franchise. And it actually seemed like we were gonna get one. The third season of Drag Race Thailand was announced on July 16, 2021 by the production company Tay Cantana on social media. But despite Tay's announcement, Cantana's license of Drag Race Thailand expired due to the prolonged hiatus of the series. But I think that if we make it clear to World of Wonder that fans won a third season of Thailand, then I'm sure they can work something out. In the past year since the airing of UK vs The World, Pangina released her own WoW Presents series called Tongue Tied, where each episode she has a special guest that sits down with her as they enjoy different Thailand delicacies and have friendly discussions with each other. A fun fact is that Pangina actually isn't very good at cooking, so the food they eat is made by an actual chef. I mean, the last time that Pangina tried to cook for someone, it was her ex-boyfriend and he threw up so much that she thought he wasn't gonna make it. Pangina has also become the first international queen to be cast in the Las Vegas residency, and has been touring non-stop and is booked and blessed well into the future. Essentially, Pangina heals is one of the most beloved trajectories of rural girls who against all odds were able to achieve their dreams and achieve international recognition for her talent. While we are still waiting for hopefully Thailand season 3 to really go into production one day, it's safe to assume that Pangina is doing an excellent job at representing her country with her platform. Plus, Thailand's drag community is now completely different than how it was a couple years ago, so there's a lot of new drag styles that we can see showcased on a new season. Also, I want to personally thank Pangina Heels for agreeing to work with me on this video despite having a super busy schedule because she's now officially the first Rue girl that collaborates with me on the channel. I want to take a moment to thank my patrons. In the Elite Pink Squad, we have Matthew Burns, Gay Uncle, Wendell Norris Realtor, and Hendrix Health, TRT. And in the Gay Squad, we have Lone Resident, Ethan Von Queer. And finally, in the Green Squad, we have Azure, Emma Malander, Cayman Rider Furry, Franny Fishsticks, Edgar Allen Pup, O Nicole, The Only Sean, Soy Pablete, and LP. If you'd like to see your name on the screen, you can support me on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on Twitter at GreenGateYT for updates on future content. Comment what you thought about this topic, and I'll see you guys next time.